It's Tuesday afternoon, 4 p.m. in Switzerland, and it's Space Cafe Web Talk time. Our Space Cafe Web Talk 33 minutes with Michael Byers will begin soon. Thanks for joining us for a talk today about the Outer Space Institute's open letter on kinetic anti-satellite testing. As always, we appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback. Any responses are highly valuable for us and help us to improve. I'm Thorsten Kreening, your host today and publisher of Spacewatch.Global, and we are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcast. Our next episode will be released tomorrow morning featuring the fantastic Professor Joellen Russell. So worth to listen if that comes out. For all our fans of audio content, we also started our Space Cafe Radio, where we talk with interesting people on the road, on shows, on conferences. Our first episodes are online on our website, such as Chiara's interview with Aila Raquel or my interview with Aidan Little about the UN GA Resolution 7536. Now it's, it's correct. And also here, your feedback is highly appreciated for us. So we also keep our fan shop open online for you to support us actively to become a space watcher. The edition one has cool items for you, your friends and the ones you love and your support is needed to keep our work alive. And if you have missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our website in the event section and on YouTube. So what I like in my format is I can choose my guests. That's the privilege that I have as host. So usually I know them over the last decades, or, but sometimes I get referrals and I'm pointed to humans I did not know before. And one of them is my guest today. As the saying goes, you come as a stranger and you leave as a friend. And sometimes it's true. And with that, a very warm welcome, Mike Byers, to the show. So. Let me introduce you briefly to our audience. Michael is the co-director of the Outer Space Institute, which is the global network of experts addressing major challenges in near space. And Michael also holds the Can Canada Research Chair in Global Politics and International Law. He work, his work is focusing on outer space, Arctic, serenity, climate change, the law of the sea, the law of war, and the Canadian foreign and defense policy. He has been a fellow of the Jesus College at the Oxford University. He is a professor of law at Duke University, visiting professor at universities in Cape Town, Tel Aviv, North in Norway, and Novosibirsk. That's pretty cool. And his book, International Law and Arctic, um, which won the 2013 Donner Prize. And together with Aaron Bowley, he writes, or he is writing the book, Who Owns Outer Space? International Law, Astrophysics, and New Space. And that's to be published in 2022. So marks the date for the book. And I'm sure there will be much, much more. With that, again, a very warm welcome and a good morning to Vancouver, Michael, to our. It's great to be today. here. It's, uh, it's we great will to make be it today here. super sharp. Are um, on time, not because we are Germans and working for a Swiss company. No, a, you will be in another round table later this this morning in St. Andrews in Scotland with the wonderful Victoria Sampson and others. And B, I will have the privilege to interview our next German astronaut on the ISS in a bit. So uh, that's reason enough to be on time. So first of all, as a disclaimer, um, you can call me biased, but I already signed the letter, as did many of you in the audience. And thanks you for that. So let's start. Michael, can you please give our audience a quick overview of the open letter we are talking here and what is it targeted? Well, the, the international open letter centers on a scientific plot. And I encourage all, all listeners, all viewers to, to see the International Open Letter on the Outer Space Institute website. And, and what we've done with this plot 
my colleague Aaron Boley and, and myself is to uh, superimpose the existing real world data concerning the trackable space debris that was created in 2019 when India tested a ground-based missile against one of its own satellites. Um, that test created no problem because none of this debris hit anything, even though several dozen of these pieces were on elliptical orbits that were crossing, for instance, the orbit of the International Space Station. But, but India made a good faith effort to, to avoid or reduce the creation of space debris. There was no problem in 2019, but we have the data from the actual tracks of the debris. And so we superimposed those debris tracks onto a future scenario in low Earth orbit, where there will be, for the purposes of this exercise, four mega constellations of communication satellites. So for instance, uh, we, we show where uh, SpaceX's Starlink uh, will be located in terms of the, the orbital shells. We show where uh, Amazon will be, where OneWeb will be, uh, where the, the new uh, planned uh, Chinese uh, mega constellation will be. And what you have when you, you superimpose the existing real world debris tracks from 2019 onto the, the location of these mega constellations is that you get this very visual, um, almost shocking uh, insight into how dangerous another anti-satellite weapon test would be in this new environment um, with, with literally tens of thousands of additional satellites and the debris crossing all of those orbital shells. The, the, the chances of a, a collision uh, would be almost exponentially higher. And of course we know because of Donald Kessler's work in 1978 that one collision by creating tens or hundreds of thousands of pieces of additional debris will then increase the chances of subsequent collisions. So we, we're showing that a, a kinetic anti-satellite weapon test in low Earth orbit would carry a substantial risk of rendering at least part of low Earth orbit too dangerous for astronauts and, and very risky uh, for unmanned spacecraft uh, like satellites. I mean, you, you alluded on that, but again, why does the test bin matters to all of us. So is that a bit exaggerated? I mean, we just saw, correct me if I'm wrong, four of the ASA tests in the last decades. And the recent one is, is already, I think, three years back or four years back from, from, from India. So, I mean, are we well, doing the, too much? The, the simple answer there is that, uh, is that countries are, are learning um, and so, yes, uh, China uh, tested a ground-based weapon against one of its own satellites in 2007. It was the largest debris-creating event um, that has ever been recorded, uh, tens of thousands of, of pieces of, of debris. Uh, and several years later, a piece of debris from that test collided and disabled a, an operational satellite. Um, the United States tested a, a missile the following year, but at such a low altitude that, that no long lasting debris was created, or at least none that we know of. Some of the debris can be so small that it's not trackable. So we, we don't actually know, but it can still be dangerous. And India in 2019 made a good faith effort to avoid creating debris. It conducted the test at 283 kilometers, but surprise, surprise, long lasting debris was created. NASA administrator at the time, Jim Bridenstein, was very pointed in his criticism of India's actions. Um, so countries are learning from this. And, and what we've identified is that, first of all, we have a serious problem going forward. If another test takes place, um, perhaps by, by, by Pakistan or Iran or North Korea, um, it could be catastrophic uh, in terms of, of limiting access to low Earth orbit and all the important things we use uh, Leo 4, 
But secondly, that the countries are learning that this is a problem. And, and when you have this, this wave of knowledge um, and, and, and you have the, um, the, the, the fact that the major space faring states don't need to test anymore. They, they can do flyby tests where they, they just aim at a set of coordinates, not at an actual satellite, or they can do computer uh, simulations. That, that you have the optimal situation for arms control. And, and this, I know, sounds a little bit uh, naive to, to many uh, listeners, many viewers, um, but we, we've been here before. In 1962, uh, the United States tested a, a nuclear uh, device in low Earth orbit, uh, a, a test called Starfish Prime at 400 kilometers above the Pacific Ocean. And it worked much better as an anti-satellite weapon than the United States had expected. They actually disabled uh, six satellites, including three of their own operational satellites. And, and within a year, the Soviet Union, the United States, uh, France, and the United Kingdom had sat down and negotiated the 1963 Limited Test Ban Treaty, which bans nuclear testing in space. It was the first space treaty. It was before the Outer Space Treaty. Um, so when there was a realization of a, a risk to access to low Earth orbit, the spacefaring states came together, negotiated a ban. And that's what we're suggesting needs to be done with respect to kinetic anti-satellite weapons test. Just that. We're not proposing to try for more, to go after non-kinetic tests at this point. Uh, the kinetic ASAT tests are the, the so-called low-hanging fruit. This can be done. And, uh, and we just wanted to, to add our voice and the voice of, of literally hundreds of other experts from around the world. Um, and, and anyone can now sign the uh, International Open Letter on the Outer Space Institute website. There's a, a wave of support building uh, for this, and it's manifested through uh, the signatures. And everyone, of course, who reads the letter then has the opportunity to learn more about this problem and to see the plot and to, to visualize the very uh, dangerous place that we're in. Who does? I mean, we will put the link to the to the letter on our, on our review and our recap for uh, for the talk. But who supports the letter today? I mean, at the moment, any of us can can sign. And I spoke with my friends at uh, Secure World Foundation, and they said, "Yeah, we all signed it." And I mean, many of the folks here in the in, in the audience potentially have signed it already, but what does our voice matter our signature matter here beside of yes read it yeah i agree to that and and let, let's let's go back to work yes well the the accumulation of, of signatures and, and we started off with some very distinguished people uh, signing this letter nobel laureates former prime ministers retired astronauts um literally hundreds and hundreds of of, of, of recognizable names, plus hundreds and hundreds of, of more um, young people, students, uh, space enthusiasts of all kinds. This spreads the news. And the more people who read the letter will learn about this problem, will visualize the, the, the crisis situation. And this, this spread of knowledge is what can support diplomatic efforts to, to actually uh, negotiate a ban. So, th so that's what we're engaged in. It's an exercise in, in, in public education, in, in knowledge dissemination, in helping people to visualize the, 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 the crisis situation, and also to identify that there is an opportunity for countries to come together and to conclude a ban. So that's what it's about. It's, um, we're not so much trying to, to lobby the United Nations as to inform the world. Okay. So do you have a, a few names of, of signatories are for, for, for the letter for our audience. I mean, I should say, hey, distinguish people is, is so broad, you know, but yeah. you have some examples for us. Well, well yes. So I, I, I mentioned a former prime minister, uh, Kevin Rudd, the former prime minister of Australia is a signatory. Um, so are a number of former Canadian foreign ministers, uh, defense ministers, so Lloyd Axworthy, who, who led the creation of the International Criminal Court and the creation of the, uh, the treaty banning anti-personnel landmines, he's a signatory of this, a former uh, foreign minister of, of Canada. 
Um, Chris Hatfield, uh, the Canadian uh, astronaut who, who very famously took his guitar uh, to the International Space Station is a, is a signatory of this letter. Um, and, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, literally hundreds of, of leading scientists, uh, uh, space scientists, uh, uh, and also uh, scientists in the social sciences and in international law, um, so, um, you know, I, I don't want to pick too many names because it suggests that some people are more important than others, uh, but the, the full list is available under the letter on the Outer Space Institute website. And the signatures that I am most excited about are the young people, are the, 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 the students from around the world who are studying space, who, who want to be involved working on space issues in government, in industry. Um, those are the signatures that matter most to me because we're trying to build a wave of, of realization of knowledge that we can actually um, develop space in a safe and sustainable way, and that we can identify a crisis before it, it becomes a full-blown crisis, and we can avoid it through collective action. Got it, got it. I mean, you talked about the purpose of this letter, of this global education, and I think we also addressed so how changing a letter can how signing a letter can change the world. So, but what are obstacles at the moment you're you're facing? Is it going smooth and you say, yeah, we have just a nice talk because it's going well already. So, but is it the case? Well, we we had a a, a wonderful coincidence of, of timing in that uh, several diplomats from the United Kingdom uh, were in parallel to us taking forward an effort uh, at the United Nations General Assembly. Um, and uh, last year in 2020, they had put a, a, a resolution before the General Assembly that was adopted, that resulted in states conveying their views regarding space threats, uh, security threats, uh, conveying their views to the United Nations Secretary General. And the Secretary General released a, a report uh, tabulating all these views before we published the International Open Letter. So we were able to point at those, those views expressed by states, um, all of which supported uh, some kind of collective uh, restriction on space weapons. Um, and, and perhaps most significantly, not a single country suggesting uh, that the uh, use of uh, an anti-satellite weapon for, for testing uh, was appropriate or legal. They all agreed that this is a bad thing. Um, and so we were able to, to pick up on uh, that report from the United Nations Secretary General. And now to our, our, our considerable uh, satisfaction, um, the uh, British delegation at the United Nations General Assembly has put forward a second resolution, which will be voted on in the next few weeks. And that resolution, if adopted, would create a, an open-ended working group that would begin to not only discuss, but potentially negotiate a, a document on space weapons uh, that might well uh, include some kind of ban on kinetic anti-satellite weapons. Uh, an open-ended working group is the first step in treaty negotiations. And it might be that it's only a non-binding resolution that uh, is adopted by the General Assembly. But international law is made in incremental steps. And the, the fact that the, the British delegation is taking these steps uh, gave us further energy because we could deliver a wave of outside public support uh, for their efforts some shameless advertisement here. So two weeks ago, um, when I was in Geneva at the Unity Air Space Security Conference, I had the absolute honor to discuss that with the UK ambassador, Aidan Little. And we spoke about the UNGA resolution and it's still hard for me to say it's the number because it's, because it's 7536, so uh, now I'm right. Um, as you mentioned, uh, he talked about the working group uh, and what they tried to establish with it. But how do you see this letter and these UN activities interconnected? Is the letter just 
supporting this international efforts as you said before or are there more concrete steps well let me be clear we're not telling the diplomats how to do their jobs so um, they are the the professionals uh, at uh, at international negotiations uh, we're just pleased that that they identify the the seriousness of the challenge and are taking steps to to bring countries together. That that's fabulous. So we we hope they succeed. Um, but we also want to to build global knowledge about this this crisis, to put pressures on individual governments to exercise restraint, to encourage uh, national governments to watch carefully as to what their militaries are doing uh, in terms of possible tests. So it's. It's reputed that the uh, Chinese military did not tell the senior leaders of the Chinese government that the 2007 ASAT test would create long-lasting space debris, that they, uh, they, they didn't fully disclose the possible consequences of their action. We want national governments to be aware so that they can exercise uh, you know, close oversight of, of their militaries with regards to, to possible tests. Um, but we also want to, to build momentum so that if the process at the United Nations General Assembly fails, that, that a group of countries might decide to take the negotiating efforts elsewhere. And this indeed is what happened with anti-personnel landmines, where there was an ad hoc negotiating conference that was called by Canada, or with regards to the banning of cluster munitions where the government of Norway created an ad hoc negotiating process outside of the United Nations. Now, we don't think that's necessary yet. Uh, thanks to Ambassador Little and his colleagues uh, in the British uh, uh, Foreign Ministry, uh, there is a lead country on this file. I know that the Canadian delegation is strongly supporting the, the British effort. And I have reason to believe that the British would not be taking this effort uh, if the United States was not quietly uh, supportive of this move also. Okay, so let's talk about some concrete next steps. Um, what are those? And to, to frame it also and bring in our audience. So what can our audience do to support this letter beside signing of what is obvious? Yeah. Yes, well, not only signing the letter, but uh, sharing it as widely as possible. Um, and, and so, uh, for instance, uh, all of those academics who, who are watching uh, us today might wish to um, share the, the letter with their students, uh, perhaps even use it as a, uh, an opportunity for a discussion in class. Um, again, I, I come back to the scientific plot. It's unusual to find a scientific plot in a... Uh, an open letter. And we had some people who said that it was a bad idea. Um, and Aaron Boley and I took the opposite view that a picture is indeed worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. And this visualization was important. It takes some time to fully understand it. You need to actually study the plot and read the subtext and, and figure out what the lines actually mean. But once you, you actually see it, you realize that we are in a crisis situation. And that if we do not uh, somehow prevent further kinetic ASAT tests that we will lose access to low Earth orbit. And if we lose access to low Earth orbit, uh, we, we lose access to uh, Earth imaging uh, for agriculture, for fisheries, um, for disaster relief. Um, we lose access to, to communications of all kinds. Um, and, and it's not just uh, civilian uses of the space that are impacted, but also uh, military security uses of space. Modern militaries are, are heavily dependent on, on low Earth orbit uh, for, for reconnaissance, uh, uh, for communications, uh, for the you know, operation of uh, unmanned aircraft, uh, even for targeting. Um, and, and let me make this point uh, absolutely explicit. I believe that we can have success with this effort, that we can ban anti-satellite weapons because the modern militaries of this world have a strong interest in maintaining safe access to low Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the United States military should support this international open letter. 
so too should the military of China, of Russia. The Indian military should support this letter because it supports their interests. It preserves safe access to low earth orbit. And as I've said already, all of these spacefaring countries already know that in a war situation, they could destroy an opponent's satellites. They have this capability. They've tested it in the past. They can simulate it with computers today or do flyby tests with no impacts. They don't need to test. Mm -hmm. They therefore need to get on board with this global wave of opinion that we're creating, that anti-satellite weapons tests that create debris are bad for all of humanity. And I go back to, to 1963 and the limited test ban treaty. We had a moment of realization then with regards to the extreme risk to access to low Earth orbit from nuclear tests in space. And within a year, we banned it. During the Cold War, an agreement between the United States and the Soviet Union. This is possible. This is something that we can do. I'd like to point out one, one thing what maybe not is so obvious for all our readers. If I'm right, then bringing it to the General Assembly or of the United Nations also means it is adapted by the majority. It does not need a consensus like we see it in Copius or in other uh, committees. So they just can go for it. And so we will see hopefully within the next four to six weeks our a, a go no go. Is that correct? Well, you're you're absolutely right um, that the General Assembly uh, operates on the basis of of one state, one vote. Uh, it's not a consensus based organization, and, and so any resolution uh, can be adopted by the majority, um, and uh, and that means that I think it's likely this open ended working group will be created in the next few weeks. Okay. Full credit, full credit to the, the British diplomats. Uh, normally, uh, an initiative like this would take place in the Conference on Disarmament um, because it's, it's a, a disarmament issue. But the Conference on Disarmament operates on the basis of consensus and has, for that reason, been essentially frozen for several decades now. Going the route of the UN General Assembly uh, gives us the prospect of, of forward movement, of actual success here. Uh, so, so that is important. But the other thing I need to say is that uh, um, we need to encourage uh, Russia and China to get behind this diplomatic effort. Um, they've actually been pushing for a much more comprehensive treaty that deals with all aspects of space weapons. Uh, they want to go for the, the full... Uh, deal on this, the, the comprehensive instrument. Um, and, and I would suggest that uh, uh, if we can agree on the first step and actually adopt a ban on kinetic ASAT testing, that can then uh, open up the path to something more comprehensive. Uh, so Russia uh, and China are not opposed to this initiative, but they haven't thrown their full support behind it because they don't think that it goes far enough. Um, and that's not a bad thing because obviously uh, cooperation depends on everyone getting to at least a certain point. And everyone, I think, is at that point. Uh, we just need to stop for uh, a few months, a few years and seal this limited deal before we move forward again together. Thank you very much. I would like to take really uh, just two questions from, from the audience uh, before we have this or hard cut today. First one are um, from, from Jessica, uh, Jessica West, and thank you very much for sending them over. Critics suggest that the focus is too much on debris sustainability and not enough on arms control. How might in this initiative help to quell an arms race or, and contribute to sustainability, of course? So, that's yeah, the and, and Jessica and I are, are, are good friends and colleagues, and uh, I, I think she's asking the question so that I can make the point that the, the issue of, of, of sustainability and security are actually just two sides of the same coin, uh, that, uh, that we can't have, have security uh, in space without sustainability, that we, we, we are facing a debris challenge, and, and if anything, that helps us to engage in meaningful arms control. 
Um, different actors have different interests, uh, but we believe that they align with regards to, to prohibiting the testing of kinetic ASAT weapons. Okay, so um, I think the other one, it's all, um, no, we can. Is there a risk, and another one from Jessica, that other states might try to test before a ban comes into effect, so not to be left out? Interesting one, I think. Are there immediate uh, intermediate steps to solve? Yeah, uh, it, it, that's a great question. Thank you. And I, I think the answer there is is twofold. First of all, the more that people learn about the risk, the, the actual potential for losing access to low Earth orbit, the more they'll realize it's not in their self-interest to engage in a test, even if no ban has yet been adopted. So, so the knowledge itself should uh, constrain any uh, informed, responsible country uh, with regards to, to this issue. Um, and the, the, the second thing to, to say there, um, is that this is precisely the problem. We, this is why we need a ban quickly and, and, and not a delayed process. And that's why I've thrown my weight 100% behind the efforts of the, the British diplomats. Um, they might not be specifically uh, pointed themselves towards a, a, a limited test ban treaty of the kind we're proposing, um, but uh, their effort is pretty close. and. Uh, and we all need to come together and realize that international cooperation on space weapons is needed now. And it's needed because of safety and security issues, because we need a more peaceful planet. And it's also needed because we have so much interest in preserving uh, safe access uh, to low Earth orbit for all of these civilian and military purposes around the world. Great. Thank you very much. Mark, I think we answered your question already. Um, thanks for sending them over. But I'm afraid we have to come to an end. So even so, that's, that's such an important and fascinating topic that uh, we could speak more often about that. Be assured we will continue following space security and especially this this, uh, this letter in our future Space Cafe web talks on our magazine and our radio and so on. So before we finish to, for today, do not miss a um, Michael's uh, talk later on, or so in an hour from now, 5 p.m. UK time today at the St. Andrews University banning ASA test. So same topic, different round table. And on our end on also one of the signatories of the, uh, of the letter on the 14th on Thursday at 4 p.m. Uh, Central European summer time, we have the next Moribas Vox Populi. Uh, where our good friend Moriba Ja will discuss with Stuart Blaine, Bain, uh, Darren uh, McKnight, some of the outcomes of the Amos uh, conference, uh, Doug Hendricks and so on. So it's a full panel and we take an hour and it's Moriba style, so uh, expect the unexpected. So it, next week I have the great honor to speak uh, in my 33 minutes with Dr. Agnieszka Lukaszczyk from Planet um, about uh, what Planet can do uh, for, for Europe, especially for Europe and the European Green Deal and how we can work together. On the same week, our, our next launch and learn why powering space will take place on the 21st at 1 p.m. and on the 26th, what is the Tuesday during the IAC? We have a 33 minutes with my good friend Remco Timmermans live from the IAC. And that means also I will be not at IAC, so I um, hope th that ones that go will have a lot of fun. All the events are going to be online on Eventbrite. As always, we would like to hear your feedback, so please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up to our daily and bi-weekly newsletters and to the letter. And if you like to treat yourself with something special, become a Space Watcher today. Your support will help us take your credit card and visit our fan shop at shop.spacewatch.global. It can't be easier. And I mean, Thanksgiving was in Canada. Thanksgiving is coming in the US. So make your friends some are some nice gifts. So thank you all very much for your interest today. And thank you, Michael, for this inspiring and absolutely needed talk and being, of course, my guest. Thanks again to the entire team to uh, behind the scene for doing their great job week by week. And I hope you all would stay safe, stay healthy, 
thank you very much for joining us today. Hope to see you on Thursday with, uh, with Moriva or next week. In the meantime, visit our website, follow us on social media, and don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you very much. Michael, all the best. Take good care.